This story begins in May 1944. It's a pivotal part of the war. To the south, the Allied forces have driven the Axis forces out of North Africa, through Sicily and into Italy. And they've just broken through the German defences at the Gustav Line at Monte Cassino, and they're poised to take Rome. On the Eastern Front, the Soviet Red Army is building on its successes the year before. There was a major battle at Kursk, and after that, the Red Army is now able to drive westwards through the Ukraine. Everybody knows the Allies are going to invade at some point into the West, but what the Germans don't know is where the invasion is going to come and when it's going to come. So they can't conceal these millions of men sat there in, in, you know, on the south coast. So what they develop is a, a deception strategy, which is designed to throw the Germans off guard. And it's to suggest, really, several things. It could be that the invasion is, um, is, is going to come in a, a different place. So from, I suppose, about the year before, in, in early in 1943, the Allies had decided that they were actually going to invade through Normandy. But through bodyguard, this deception tactic made the Germans think that perhaps the invasion would come in the south of France, or a different part of the north, um, along the Pas de Calais, which was the shortest uh, channel crossing. And actually, that's the area where the Germans most suspected that the invasion would come. But they also had some schemes that perhaps the invasion would come through Norway, or the Biscay coast of France. And so Bodyguard threw out all of these ideas uh, to confuse the Germans. And the way they did this, is there were several means. The first was by using decoy um, tanks and trucks to, um, you know, to just simulate armies sat there in Kent, um, looking like they were going to go across the channel to Calais. They had dummy landing craft, ships, all sorts of things. There were men driving around in trucks, um, simulating the radio traffic of all of these, um, you know, these these decoy armies really but they also had other means so they had double agents working for them where they could send the germans messages uh, that were deceptions in themselves and this story the operation copperhead as it was known is part of that overall deception scheme to implement these deception plans the allies had several secret organizations one was called the London Controlling Section. It's a completely ambiguous title, no idea what it controlled, except that it was in London. And in the uh, Mediterranean theatre was another force uh, known as A Force, commanded by a, a very eccentric officer called Dudley Clark. Now, Dudley Clark was in Naples and he went to the cinema and he saw a film called Five Graves to Cairo. And in this was an actor who he thought looked like Montgomery. And he thought, this is a fantastic idea. We'll, we'll hire this guy and we can, you know, we can deceive the Germans um, by having, you know, Montgomery allegedly somewhere else at the time of the invasion. If we produced Montgomery in the Middle East and made sure the Germans knew about it, you know, an open top secret, there's a fair chance they'd buy it. That's a big if. Listen, I, uh, I saw Monty tonight. You what? Uh, not officially. I uh, went to the theatre. Monty made an appearance on the stage. Big reaction. Audience went wild. Or at least uh, somebody so like Monty that he fooled me and about 1,200 others. Is the penny beginning to drop? The actor that Dudley Clark had seen was a chap called Miles Mander. When they actually made contact with him, Mander turned out to be far too tall to impersonate Montgomery in person. So they went to Wardour Street and started going through some of the acting agencies there, looking for an actor that they could, they could make up to look like Montgomery. And it was there that they found um, an actor by the name of Clifton James, who was perfect for the job. Now, actually, in Clifton James's memoir, he said he was uh, photographed by um, one of the local papers up near Leicester, where he was based because the photographer just happened to think he did look like Montgomery and posted that picture in a newspaper. And so Clifton James always thought that somebody in London had seen this, actually thought he was going to get into trouble for impersonating Montgomery. But whichever way it was, they found Clifton James. And, of course, they couldn't phone him up and say, um, we want you to impersonate Montgomery in a deception. 
So they got the actor David Niven, who was a colonel in the British Army at the time. They got him to phone James up and say to him, oh, we've got a part in some official army films. Can you please come to London for an audition? Lieutenant James here. Yeah? Oh, James, we want you for an army film. Could you say that again, sir? Uh, I said we might be able to use you in one of our army training films. Look, I'm coming through Leicester tomorrow. I thought we might have a word about you. Could I have your name again, sir? Major Harvey. Major Harvey. 12.30 12 tomorrow. Queen's Hotel. Could you tell me anything about the part, sir? Hello. You know, if I thought you were really a security risk, you wouldn't be here. I got quite a big file on you. I know where you went to school, who your friends are, what books you read the lot. <laughs> oh, really? I suppose I, um, I owe you an apology. You see, I'm nothing to do with army films. I'm an intelligence officer and you've just been recruited. What is? A very big noise. You may not be God's gift to the theatre, but you've got one special talent we need very badly. You look like Monty. Oh, Monty, that. Why, I only did that appearance as a gag. Well, we're going to make that gag pay off. You're going to act as Monty's double before D-Day. Time was pressing. Once James had actually got over the shock of what they were asking him to do, they arranged for him to spend a day on Montgomery's staff just so that he could observe the general at close quarters and so he could follow him around and look at his mannerisms, how he held himself and listen to his voice. And it's um, something that's shown in the film and they play it up for laughs in the film, the ridiculousness of a, a man who looks like Montgomery following Montgomery but trying not to be noticed that he looks like Montgomery. And it's actually one of the, you know, one of the good parts of the film. Um, but as I say, it, it, they sent him back for a second time and he, you know, being an actor, he did pick up all of those traits to pass himself off. The thing with Clifton James is he was an absolute bag of nerves and they thought actually what would be good is let's get him to meet Montgomery in person and hopefully that might calm him down and also that he could observe him really at, at close quarters because you've got to remember here that, that Clifton James might meet people who actually knew Montgomery so he had to be absolutely completely believable to everybody for this to, to work and actually as it turned out the Montgomery uh, and James met and uh, spent some hours together um, they found they had some bits in common. Both had fought in the First World War. Um, Clifton James had been born in uh, Perth in Australia and Montgomery had spent his childhood in Tasmania. So they had that in common. And actually, by the time they finished, uh, Montgomery had really um, sort of persuaded James that he was up for this and that the job he was doing was vitally important. So these wartime deceptions might sound like a bit of fun now, uh, but actually at the time, it's deadly serious, because if the Germans had realised there was an actor impersonating Montgomery, they might have deduced that, hang on a minute, this guy's in, in Gibraltar pretending to be Montgomery. Where's the real Montgomery? Why are they trying to hide what he's doing? And from that, they might deduce that actually something was about to happen, and so they could put their forces on alert. Um, you know, the invasion would no longer be a surprise. The other thing was James was terrified that people would see through him and realise he was a dupe. Not because he didn't look like Montgomery, they, they looked like twins, and he, he had all the mannerisms. But he lacked Montgomery's confidence in front of people. It's that, you know, that, that inner self-conviction that Montgomery had, the leadership in him. James was a complete bag of nerves, as I've said. So he really did think if people realise I'm not the real him, he could be in trouble. The Germans were known to have agents in Algeciras. So this is the, the point of Spain, which is overlooking Gibraltar. And the idea was that if they could fly their decoy Monty into Gibraltar um, with lots of fanfare, with you know uh, official welcome and so on, the, the likelihood was that people would be looking to see who was getting off that aircraft and they would see Montgomery in Gibraltar. 
So in case the Germans weren't at their telescope, they actually arranged for a Spanish liaison officer who they knew was a German spy to just happen to pop right by the governor's residence in Gibraltar on the morning that the decoy Montgomery would arrive. And he would just happen to see the general having breakfast. So they knew that, that even if the arrival at the airport was missed, the likelihood was that this, um, you know, this German spy would, would see him at the governor's residence. And then they were going to pack Montgomery off, send him off to North Africa, to Algiers, and then to Cairo. And so, again, as shown in the film, there was, there was a sort of a, you know, the idea was, was to show Montgomery uh, leaving uh, the United Kingdom, going to Gibraltar, and then touring through North Africa, nowhere near France. A number of things went wrong with this mission. Just before James was about to get onto the aircraft, um, they noticed his middle finger on his right hand was missing. He'd actually lost this, uh, he'd been wounded in the First World War, uh, but through habit he kept his right hand in his pocket or behind his back and nobody had noticed that he was missing the finger and James didn't say anything about it, it didn't occur to him. But right at the last minute, they suddenly realised if he's shaking hands with the governor of Gibraltar and this, uh, with such an obvious wound, this, this is going to blow the whole scheme. So they had to make a prosthetic finger at short notice and um, attach that to the decoy. Then there was a panic because nobody James had never flown before and they didn't know if he'd be airsick. And so you couldn't have Montgomery falling out of the plane at Gibraltar, you know, looking green from this from this terrible experience he did. So at short notice, they had to get an aircraft and take James up and fly him around a few loop the loops and things just to see if he survived that. And then they could put him onto the aircraft in safe knowledge. Now, the other thing was Montgomery didn't drink and he didn't smoke. James did both. And so they had to say to him, you can't be seen smoking and you can't drink. Now, we don't know if this is true or not, but allegedly on the way to Gibraltar, uh, James had smuggled a bottle of gin with him. And actually when they arrived at Gibraltar, they had to spend an hour circling around the airfield while he sobered up because they obviously he couldn't land drunk. By all accounts, Montgomery's arrival in Gibraltar was noticed by the Germans and was signalled to Berlin. So the German military intelligence service, the Abwehr, certainly uh, started taking notice of Montgomery's movements. And as he moved to North Africa, there were a number of uh, Allied double agents that also transmitted um, you know, news of Monty's progress. Uh, the German Abwehr started thinking, oh, is, is, does this mean southern France is going to be the invasion um, destination? So there was the speculation. So as planned, that speculation started to happen. And the intriguing thing here is, is the way the Allies knew this was because, of course, they'd broken the Abwehr's uh, Enigma codes. So we all know today about Bletchley Park and, and all of that. Obviously, at the time, that was one of the most closely guarded secrets on Earth. Only a few people actually knew where this intelligence was coming from. So the, the reason the Allied deception was so um, successful is they were able to, you know, send out a, a piece of deception like this Operation Copperhead and then they could monitor the German radio traffic to see had the Germans picked this up and had they fallen for it. So one of the sadder aspects of the story is once Clifton James reaches Cairo he's bundled off into a safe house and there, there he's left really. No one can see him because they don't want people to realise the uh, an impersonator has been walking around looking like Montgomery. And apparently it's up to six weeks before they find a flight home for him. Because, you know, if you think about it, it's um, there's a war on, it's a critical part of the war, and they, they need to prioritise who's getting put into aircraft. So he, he just sat there waiting to go home. One of the funny things about all of this is, of course, he was married, um, and he hadn't been able to tell his wife where he was going. Um, and he'd only really put in for a, a week's leave. So his wife had no idea where he'd gone, uh, only that it was on some filming assignment. Uh, so all of these things would have played on, on his mind. Having been given this amazing mission, you know, imagine you're a, 
a fairly small time actor really as Clifton James was he he did you know small parts here and there to suddenly be you know to play the role of one of the most famous people in the world at that time um to be flown to Gibraltar to meet the governor general and then a tour of North Africa all of the uh, you know cheering troops and everything then to be bundled into a safe house and, and forgotten uh, you can imagine how frustrating it was having signed the official secrets act that you couldn't tell anyone so of course he did tell people you know probably in the early 50s he happened to tell this story while a journalist was there and the journalist wasn't going to pass up on this story, and so published it. And, and that was it then, the news became public. Well, having told his story, technically speaking, James should have been arrested under the Official Secrets Act before they even told him he was going to impersonate Montgomery. The first thing they did to him when he arrived in London was sign here, don't tell anybody about this. But... Actually, when they looked at this particular case, it it was you know that you know what we're we talking about, eight years after the war, it was fairly harmless really to let people know about this. And actually, there was in a in official circles there was a, a recognition that James had been treated quite shabbily actually, you know, just to have done this incredible service and then forgotten about. And so I think they thought let him have his moment in the sun here in, this, in, in the spotlight so the year before James came out with his story about impersonating Montgomery another deception story had hit the news there was the, a famous book called The Man Who Never Was by Ewan Montague and Montague had actually been one of the wartime deception um, you know intelligence people and the story that Montague put out was absolutely incredible how they um found the body of a you know a sort of welsh vagrant that died from eating rat poisoning and they sent him off to um you know to to the mediterranean in a submarine dressed in the uniform of a british officer holding false documents and they launched him off the coast of spain um so that the germans would would get the secret documents he was carrying so in comparison, the story of impersonating Montgomery was actually quite tame. I think the authorities were quite lenient on that. That you know, it, it was a good story, a good wartime yarn. But also the other thing, I I read in particularly in the book, um, James didn't really know who he'd worked for. He had some inkling that there was lots of other deception going on, but he didn't know who who was doing this. He actually thought he was working for MI5, which he thought was a, a branch, of, branch of military intelligence, not the security service. And at the time, nobody really knew about MI5. It wasn't officially admitted to by the British government till the 1980s. So I think there was almost a sort of element of uh, a second element of deception in the story of, you know, it, it covered up the real wartime groups that were running these, you know, very large deceptions, um, you know, with things like the Enigma breaking, the use of German double agents to plant deception. Actually, the James story is a good wartime yarn. Let's get it out there to the public. Watching the film again, we can see how the script writers have, um, you know, have obviously enhanced the story uh, somewhat. Uh, there are some quite fanciful things. So at the beginning of the film, we see the actor John Mills arriving in a boat as if he's just escaped from occupied France. And it makes him look like one of these special operations executive agents. The people that were involved with planning deception, there's no way on earth they would have been allowed over into the occupied territories. Um, we see quite a lot of the film is played for laughs. You see a sort of young Sid James as a night porter in there. Kitchen closed 10 o'clock. No chance of a drink. Bar closed 10.30. You haven't got an evening paper. You have to order one. Thanks. Did you want it to read? Uh, that was the idea. And towards the end of the film, to stop the story from fizzing out, as, as in reality it did, the scriptwriters have inserted this entire episode of German commandos landing to capture... Montgomery. Well, none of that happened. That's a 
you know, a device for the script writers there. But the one thing you get from the film uh, that's really important is, and it's quite unique really, is Clifton James is playing himself. So this really is the man who impersonated Montgomery. And the main thing that comes across is his bewilderment at the mission and the terror that he had. He was so nervous about the whole thing that he would, he would make a mistake, that people's lives would be in danger because of it. Um, and that really, really comes across well in the film. And that makes it quite a unique document in itself.